All right, so as you can see, we're doing something very different today because I'm coming to you from my desk and not the bar. And actually, uh, I know a lot of you think I live behind that bar, but the reality is, is that I live behind this desk. So much more of the show happens here than in the bar. This is where I develop episodes and come up with the ideas for the episodes, and I do a lot of the editing for the episodes, and I write a lot of the on-screen text for the episodes, and I upload the episodes, and I reply to comments, and I spend a lot of time here responding to emails and coordinating things, and all that happens here. But the reason I'm coming to you from here today is because I want to answer a question for you that I get asked all the time, which is always some version of, hey, Greg, what's your favorite original cocktail that you made for the show over the years on how to drink? I got to tell you, I have like over 300 episodes of this show. I can't even remember half of them at any given moment. So I'm very bad at answering that question on the spot. I wanted to give you guys a good answer with the assistance here of my voiceover mic and take a look at my 10 favorite original creations on the show. If you guys like this kind of thing, maybe we can do this more often from time to time. If you hate this kind of thing, don't worry, we won't do it again. Uh, anyway, without any further ado, let's take a look at the Johnny Silverhand from Cyberpunk 2077. The corporations control their world from their skyscraper fortresses, enforcing their rule with armies of cyborg assassins on the street Booster gangs roam a shattered urban wilderness. The rest of the world is a perpetual party as fashion model beautiful techies rub bioscope jobs with battle armored road warriors in the hottest clubs, sleaziest bars, and meanest streets this side of the post Holocaust. The future never looks so bad. This is cyberpunk. Cyberpunk is just so over the top. We're in the afterlife, and our pal Jackie orders us two tequila old fashions with a splash of cerveza, and the bartender calls this a Johnny Silverhand. Uh, we don't get a fantastic look at the drink in the game, but there's actually not much to see anyway. It's just sort of like a, you know, geometric glass with, with much, not much that we can see in it. My only problem with this drink, the Johnny Silverhand, as it's described in the game, is that it is, it's, it's an old fashioned that you splash a beer into. I don't, what is, what is that? What's the point of that? Like a splash of beer in an old fashioned? Anyway, I, I played around with that idea a bit and I sort of had stumbled into this idea that maybe we lose the ice from the old fashioned. And then instead of just splashing beer across the top, it's a float of beer. And we do more of a 50-50 thing. So it's not a splash and it gets very much, it gets a lot closer this way to being a very refined boiler maker. It's tricky to float a beer on a cocktail. Uh, there's a lot of physics involved about specific gravity and fluid densities and stuff like that. Liquor in a cocktail is going to be less dense than most beer. Um, and so the, they're either going to want to mix and not separate very well, or the beer is going to want to sink right to the bottom. It's, it's a tricky thing to, to do. And I specifically did want this drink to have a layered look as much as possible. So while I initially thought that it would be obvious to go with a Mexican beer, uh, Modelo Negra jumped out at me. It turns out Modelo Negra is too low in alcohol content to float. And also it's not really black once you pour it out of that dark glass bottle. It's pretty light in color. Uh, so that ruined uh, the initial plan that I had for a two-tone cocktail. I asked a chemist friend, how, what do you think I should do here to make this work? And he said, you know, it's tough to say, but look for the driest, highest ABV beer you can find. That might be a really good starting point. So I went to the liquor store. I put on my mask. <laughs> I wandered around suspiciously eyeing everybody else at the liquor store. I put on my mask and I went to the liquor store and I shopped around and what I found was the Lost Abbey Ag Ag uh, blah, 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 blah. Agave Maria Ale from the Lost Abbey is very dark in color and it's 13.5% by volume. It is right at the edge of being less dense or more dense than the cocktail and it sort of mostly floats. Um, at the very least, when I've played with this before I shot it, I've managed to get a very nice gradient uh, from the bottom to the top. Another happy accident in testing this is that the uh, this is a shockingly delicious combination with this cocktail to the point where I think it transcends being a video game drink adaptation. This should be served. This should be on menus or something. I don't know. You know, it would be an expensive drink to serve because this is not cheap. But oh my God, it's so good. I did think originally that using this beer would be a mistake thematically, but one of the core aspects of cyberpunk as a genre is the blending of various cultures of Earth in really blunt just like smash you in the face kind of ways. And this beer turns out to be perfect. It's a double style ale that's made with agave and aged in tequila barrels. So it's right there with our tequila old fashioned. Winds up very tart flavor profile that I think is a bit like a sour ale, though I'm not a beer expert and it doesn't say sour ale on the bottle. So maybe it doesn't really meet the definitions of a sour ale, but it's, it's fairly sour <laughs> nonetheless. Um, whatever this beer is, 
it's great in this. So let's make a Johnny Silverhand. The first thing I need to do is prepare the glass. I'm gonna serve it in. I need a lime wedge to do that. So I'm gonna take my, my knife and my cutting board here and I'm gonna make just a wedge of lime. It doesn't have to be fancy at all because we're not doing much with this. This, the job of this lime wedge is, is pretty unimportant. Uh, it's just going, we're gonna take this and we're going to paint lime juice on the outside of this glass. And I'm gonna go with about a half of it. Uh, I'm gonna dip that into smoked chili pepper because as we know, this drink is served with a chili garnish, otherwise known as chipotle spice. I'm gonna set the glass aside. I need a mixing glass and to that I'm gonna add a little bit more than a quarter and a little bit less than a half of an ounce of simple syrup. So 15 milliliters for a half, I would go 10 milliliters if you're doing it that way. If you're metric land, I would say 12, you know. I think that uh, Dave Arnold would call this a fat quarter. Um, I'm just gonna split the difference in my jigger here, right between a quarter and a half. I have made this with Demerara simple syrup and it's fine, but there's a visual thing going on here. We wanna keep as much lightness in this drink as possible. And I think that it's just one of those cases where you should probably use a plain simple syrup, two to one ratio. Then I'm gonna need a dash of Angostura bitters and a dash of orange bitters. Orange bitters up here in New Jersey. Um, and now I need two ounces of tequila. I am using uh, this tequila, La Gretona, uh, which is a 100% blue agave. Comes in this very rustic looking bottle. Uh, it's cheap, it's like $34 compared to my normal Fortaleza. Um, and uh, yeah, it's pretty good actually. I haven't had any complaints about this uh, with this drink. I'm also the only person who's drank this drink. So why would I complain about it? That would be a weird thing for me to do, complain about my own drink. But Nonetheless, I haven't, so that's saying something, right? Yeah. Cool. Next thing we need to do is stir this up with some ice. And now I've got a freezer over here. My life is so much better. See, that great? We're gonna crack some ice straight into here. Boom, boom, boom. Stir that up really well. Normally an old fashioned gets served over a big ice cube. In this case, we're gonna serve it up. I wanna make sure I'm doing all the dilution I might want, all the chilling I might want here in the mixing glass. So this is a case where you might stir this a bit longer than you normally would in old fashioned. Okay, next thing to do, strain this into the prepared glass. It's got this very light pink color from the Angostura Habiters. I guess the orange is affecting it as well a bit. This is very fancy beer, so it comes in a champagne thing. Uh, with these guys, always point them away from anything you don't want to destroy. Ease the cork out. Done and done. Now, this is the critical phase of this drink. And even though I like to work back here for this, I have to bring it much closer to myself. It's a long reach to do that. Uh, so this is critical stuff here. Um, what you want to do is put this at the water level with the back of the spoon up. And now I want to hit the top of my bar spoon here and let it glide down the front of the bar spoon to the water level. And if we're all very lucky, this will sort of float. And by float, I mean, I'm not going to get like a New York sour look here. I'm hoping to get basically a nice gradient from the top to the bottom. And I think we've got it. Yeah, that's the look. Ooh, that's sick. Now, that's it. That is a tequila old fashioned with a bit more than a splash of cerveza um, and a chili garnish. The Johnny Silverhand. I did consider that a wedge of lime on this might be a nice addition and certainly it would be thematically appropriate, but um, it's not called for, so I'm gonna skip it. Johnny Silverhand, bottoms up. Good God, that's so good. Oh my God, that's so good. It's so many flavors at once. It is the spicy chili and like dark chocolate. Actually, dark chocolate is really dominant up front and then cherry notes. I don't, I hear cherry a lot. People talk about cherry with a sour ale and this might be a sour ale. So maybe that's where the cherry is coming from. It might also be kind of a, a flavor memory. I used to work at a machine shop with a bunch of guys who were from Owaka and they would bring in like these um, dried candied fruits, cherries and stuff like that covered in chili. And it might just sort of remind me of that. That is unreal how good that is. It does taste like a dark chocolate, spicy cherry. I'm not exaggerating. That is like, if you had to wrap it up in three words, that's what it is, but you can pull it apart. You get the, the tequila, the agave. There's a, that would, if it's smoke, it's not like a scotch smoke. It's like a very dark, bitter chocolate smoke. And of course, Chipotle is pretty smoky. <laughs> I went down the squiggly pipe as my kid likes to say. Oh man, woo, it's so good.
is an unbelievably good drink. So I got the dark chocolate, I got cherry spice, that's smoky chipotle spice, and it does set your mouth on fire and it's wonderful. But the one nice thing is that um, if you prep this in advance, the lime and the chipotle really seat together and, and dry in a way that like a salted rim doesn't. So even though it looks like you're just putting pure chili powder in your mouth, which is fine, um, it's not as overpowering and, and it's not like eating a spoonful of chipotle like you might expect it to be. If you're into that kind of thing, you might like it anyway. It has this really cool light and dark layered look, which um, I think makes it very unique. And it kind of reminds me of like a very, like I said before, like a very, very sophisticated boiler maker. Like who would, I, I would never occur to me to put a beer on top of an old fashioned, except for that that drink in the video game. And then I had to make it good. And I think I, I feel like I did, I feel like I did. Oh yeah. And when you get into, when you start the tequila, you get the beer and Chipotle and the cherry and the chocolate first, but then that tequila comes through. Wow, that's really awesome. This really is a good drink. If not for the fact that that is in short supply, this would be something that would be like, I would have one of these every week. This would be, this is not, like I said, it's not just a prop drink. This is a genuinely wonderful cocktail. I am not tooting my own home. I hope you make it yourself. I am deeply impressed by it. Mm. Since then, I've done several more episodes from the Cyberpunk series, and Cyberpunk has gotten adapted into a hit anime series on Netflix, and now they're getting an expansion. Uh, if you're interested in my other Cyberpunk videos, I'll throw a link up there. Let's move it right along to the rusty anchor that I invented for Golden Girls. Um, I love this drink so much. I really uh, feel like this particular episode of How to Drink was just criminally underseen. And if you threw a party, invited everyone you knew, you would see the biggest gift was from me and the card attached would say, boom, 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 boom. Thank you for being a friend. Oh my God, we're talking about the Golden Girls. Now Blanche liked to spend her time, when she had it, down at a little bar called the Rusty Anchor. You're going to introduce me to some of your friends? Yes, if I see anybody I know. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and I'm wearing no underwear. <laughs> uh, Blanche, I think in one episode famously was kicked out of the bar for mixing a margarita in a sailor's mouth, which, um, I mean, I would volunteer. Anyway, we're gonna make a drink I call the Rusty Anchor, and it, it's a variation on a rusty nail. Uh, it seems like it's self-evident, it has to be. Rusty nails are typically built in the glass they're drunk from, that is the way to do. So we're gonna start by cracking ice into our glass. Thank you for being a friend, for going down the road and back again. And if you threw a party. Oh wait, no. You're a true friend. You're a pal and a confidant. It's probably Reba McIntyre's best hit. That's gotta be a Reba song, right? I want a half an ounce of lemon juice. A half an ounce of lemon juice. Why am I wearing a Hawaiian shirt in this episode? Because we're in Miami. I need one ounce of Drambuie. I only have these tiny bottles, but I have more than one of them. Drambuie is a liqueur made from scotch. And just to answer the question I know I will inevitably get, no, there is no substitution for Drambuie. It is what it is. It is Drambuie. <laughs> the rusty nail it kind of turns on Drambuie. That is its thing that distinguishes it. A rusty nail is nothing more than this and scotch. Uh, so if we're gonna do a rusty nail variation, Drambuie is a necessity. And now I want two ounces of gin, a London dry gin. When I was working on this drink, I had the idea that, well, it's gotta be sort of the nautical answer to a rusty nail. And when I think nautical, I think of two things. I think of gin and rum. I worked on a rum version. I didn't like as much as the gin version. So the gin won the day. Give it a little stir. Delicious. But we're missing something. We need to now add kind of a float, kind of a float of four to six dashes of Angostura bitters. It really makes this drink. Just dash it across the top so that it all hangs out up there and sinks down. I've gone to like 30 dashes of Angostura bitters. I really like Angostura. 
and it's going to migrate its way down. That's your rust in the rusty anchor. And there we have a rusty anchor, a drink I created to honor the Golden Girls. Um, my notes tell me that I'm not going to garnish this, but that I should serve it with a side of cheesecake. Uh, so here we go. Cheesecake and a rusty anchor. Holy goddamn hell, that is delicious. Oh my God, that is so good. Oh, I love it. Let's do that again. Let's talk about what this actually tastes like. Cinnamon and sweet gives way to juniper from the London Dry and like a citrus notes, lemon juice, and the, I think some kind of a bitter orange thing that's present in the, the London Dry Gin, the, uh, the Fords. The Angostura God, that's good. Now the Drambui is um, this sweet, but sophisticated, spicy, but not like hot spicy, but like cinnamon, nutmeg spicy kind of a thing. The foundation of this drink, you get that throughout, uh, kind of accentuated by those London dry juniper or citrus notes, which is kind of punched in the face by the <laughs> Angostura bitters notes the gentian and the cinnamon and the, uh, I don't even, you know, nobody, I don't know what's in Angostura bitters. And I'm just gonna say it, it goes so good with cheesecake. It really does. Something about that it has a hell of a combination of flavors. I never, I haven't, my, I, um, I strongly encourage you to enjoy a cheesecake with a rusty anchor. The next opportunity that you have to do so. They really just don't make sitcoms like the Golden Girls anymore. I That show is something very special. Uh, maybe it's just nostalgia. I don't know. Anyway, let's take a look at an episode when I have a very special guest, a friend of mine from college, Brennan Lee Mulligan. Hey there. I have Brennan Lee Mulligan here today on How to Drink. Woo! I think that probably Harry Palmer, uh, who serves this drink, had to make up some non-alcoholic versions. We can make it both ways. And both versions are going to start with two big-ass scoops of vanilla ice cream. Actually, extra big because of the size of these mugs. They're huge. Um, and this ice cream comes from Friendly's because that's what it's at the grocery store. <laughs> Friendly's ice cream. It's probably made at the same factory as Breyers. One, a two, a three. Shout out to Harry Palmer, the fictional bartender at the Sailor's Grave on Recreation Station 97 who invented this drink. I bartended for many years, and if someone r routinely ordered a drink that required me to get ice cream out of a freezer and scoop it, let me just tell you, you would have been kicked out of the Blarney Stone for ordering this drink more than once in an evening. I'll say that right now. It's a lot of drinks like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, it's um, so solid. My little dungeon master arms. Um, <laughs> please, I only use these to pick up dice. Here we go. That's... Oh, yeah, you need yeah, one more. One more good one lead. One more scooper. Okay, uh, Harry's recipe calls for high colonian vodka, which is in regrettably short supply on Earth. So I'm gonna be using, actually my notes say one ounce, but I'm making this thing gigantic. So I'm probably gonna throw two ounces of vodka in it. Let's do two ounces of vodka for my high colonian vodka. The thing about high colonian vodka, actually, mm -hmm. it's much more close to uh, Earth-based cream sodas. So if you're looking for an earth-based alternative, the cream soda is probably the way to go. I'm gonna say actually, probably, oh yeah, see, I knew that was gonna happen. We gotta like just double that up because that was mostly foam. Just to get yourself an extra ounce in there. It won't hurt it. <laughs> so the next one in the original recipe for this is creme de menthe. That's actually a fairly standard earth-based liqueur. We can get that from my shelf. Creme de menthe, uh, we're gonna be using Tempus Fugit. So the recipe calls for an ounce, but I'm making a double because of how huge this bucket is. So we're going to go with two ounces for my own personal practical purposes, but let's assume two ounces of two scoops of ice cream goes with one ounce of creme de menthe. Four scoops of ice cream, two scoops. Your solution! Um, you know, there really is no reason you can't just use a whole lot of mint. So start picking. Here we go. Yeah, I would just, they come out like that and just like take leaves and chuck them in there. We're going to chop Perfect. them up, don't let's worry. Let's do it. When I used to work at a sports bar in the financial district, I would tell people that we didn't have mint 
but we did. Because you hated making mojitos. I didn't want to make a mojito. Nobody wanted to make a mojito. If you see me slammed at a brunch and you order a mojito, yeah. go fuck yourself. For real. Well, I don't mean that. I've, I've, I've cut it. I'm so sorry, internet. Don't yell at me. It's HBO. You're allowed oh, to great. say whatever you want on the internet. Anyway, so uh, that's obviously, you can't just drink mint, but we're going to whack that with a semi-inert beam of positrons in a few minutes, and that'll obliterate that all up. The next ingredient in this thing that Harry calls for is a proprietary set of extracts from certain poisonous tubers, and that's his bar. At my bar, poisonous tubers come in a bottle of Angostura bitters. Very good alternative here on Earth. I'm going to be using a goodly few dashes. By the way, for those of you at home who don't mind, uh, Angostura bitters on vanilla ice cream is a is a joy. Unfortunately, it is 48% alcohol by volume. <laughs> so uh, even though I'm gonna dilute that way down, technically if I have to make, if I'm making a non-alcoholic version, the next best thing is some homemade grenadine. I'm mm. gonna throw you in a slug of that. Yes, Brennan, we're making you- um, This is gonna rule. You <laughs> <laughs> Very spicy milkshake. Did you, yes. did you sign my diabetes waiver before we started filming? I don't. I don't want to get in trouble here. Grenadine, mint, vanilla ice cream, and cream soda. Um, we would normally hit this with an inert positron beam for a couple of ribosecs. That's Harry's mm. spec. On Earth, we could use. Um, you should have one over there. This is an immersion blender. You should have one right there. For oh your wow! I've never. I've heard about these for so long. I've never gotten to use one. Okay. Yeah, you got it. And then you just got high and low. And just go in there and get to work. Oh my God. Be careful, by the way. You want to, yeah, exactly. Because otherwise it might splash back out. Okay. okay. Oh, I really want to drink this now. The final ingredient in Harry's original recipe for this is a quarter dose of pharmaceutical Kublicane. That is an extremely short supply in our corner of the galactic quadrant. I think it would be irresponsible to use what little we have in a recreational confection such as this, right? I you know, so. I think we gotta preserve that for medical needs. It's pharmaceutical grade stuff, the Kubla Kane. A good scattering of uh, original Pop Rocks <sighs> though is a surprisingly good stand-in oh, for man. Kubla Kane. I think, I hope this works out the way I'm imagining it to so. And I just, I just go nuts. <laughs> exactly oh, what we were going for, exactly. Yeah! Wow, this is exactly like the drink in the comics! It literally <laughs> blows up when they make it! Nailed it! All right, so cheers, man. And also put a pinky underneath it in case your handles let go. Hey, <laughs> slancha. I can't say that. I don't know. I don't know. Slancha? Slancha. Slancha. I, I always pronounced it slanty. <laughs> because I read it as it's written, but it's slancha, and I don't know Irish people <laughs> other than you. All right, here we go. That's surprisingly good. Oh my God, it's the best thing I've ever had in my life. Oh, the pop rocks are hitting. Ah! Are you okay? I'm good. If it's I so good. If I spill bread and mulligan, I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> that is so fucking good. <laughs> Oh, it, dude, that's, dude awesome. that's incredible. It was so fantastic getting back together with Brennan and having him on the show. What a joy to have around. And uh, hopefully we get to work again in the near future if the stars align. Up next, let's take a look at the flaming Homer from a classic episode of The Simpsons that I grew up with uh, and see if I can get through it without severely injuring myself. What you see in it is, I'm pretty sure, tequila, creme de menthe, amaretto, white wine, some kind of schnapps, maybe peppermint, and then of course, cough syrup, the uh, the final ingredient. Huh? I don't know the scientific explanation, but fire made it good. So this is gonna be my spin on it. I know what the flavor of cough syrup is like, and I think that we can be somewhat faithful to that and create a flaming mug of a drink that is a real world version of a flaming mo. Homer makes his in a blender without ice, I don't know what the heck was up with that. Why even use the blender? Why not just use a spoon? Doesn't matter. It's the way they drew it. I'm gonna make mine in a shaker. If you want to use a blender, you can. Um, I think that the, this comes out fine on cracked ice on an open pour. So that's the way I'm gonna roll. I want one dash of my absinthe and, and a light dash, perhaps even a drop. Um, I want two dashes of Angostura bitters. I want a half an ounce of grenadine. Half an ounce of grenadine. Of grenadine. One half an ounce of Punta Mez. Want a quarter of an ounce of Chambord. Now keep in mind, I, I'm working on this drink. These are ingredients that I found actually worked really well together, but also I'm trying to stay with the theme of like little bits of everything, you know, like stuff that has been sitting at the liquor cabinet for a little while that maybe doesn't get used all the time. I'm gonna bet. Somebody bought a bottle of Chambord once and they didn't know what to do with it. 
Chambord is a black raspberry liqueur. It's pretty sweet stuff, and it comes in a holy hand grenade. Drambuie? Somewhere between a quarter and a half of an ounce of the Drambuie. It's easy to overpower this drink with this. I think I'm gonna lean a little short. I need one ounce of Canadian rye. Um, I like this Canadian club whiskey here. Now, so part of that theme, right, of grabbing a little bit of everything to make this up is that it should be a split base cocktail. Um, I think that the, the Matt Bellinger version uses like three or four different rums. Um, rum blend is a cool idea. I really wanted to try and blend various spirits, like of different types. I played around a little bit. I really liked the way an ounce of this particular bottle of Canadian rye and this rum barbancourt Haitian white that I happen to like very much. I thought they worked really well together. And that's why I did that. Okay, and that's it. We're gonna shake this drink over entirely cracked ice. Let's serve that in a big old Moe's beer mug. Uh, these are available in the comments below. Pinned comment. And um, I'm gonna need to put some fire on this. The way I'm gonna do that is with a thing we call a lime boat. A piece of lime. Um, I'm gonna take two sugar cubes, you know, more if you like. I'm gonna soak these in some pure lemon extract. I'm gonna float that lime in the middle of my drink. Set them about there. And we can set them on fire. And that's the best way to get a big fire on a drink. Um, trying to do a burning float of high proof alcohol, you'll just get like small simmering bluish flames for the most part. But a big thing, something that's like that, lemon extract burns very nicely. This drink needs a straw, as you can see. And treat it like any tiki drink. Make sure you blow it out before you drink it. Gotta set a flaming melon fire. Actually, there is something though in the hold. Oh! Oh my God, that hurt! Oh fuck! I think I broke my toe. Oh my freaking ears! Tell them what happened. Well, you all saw. I'm <laughs> There's no way I'm not using that footage. The phone went off behind me and I turned around and I knocked the first version of this directly onto my foot. And this is a, the same mug. This is an indestructibly, it's a brick of glass. It probably weighs about six pounds, seven pounds. Directly fell on my foot. Um, sorry, we don't have slow motion of that. Hold. Like that on fire. Oh, big old tiki fire here. And then, um, this is like kind of a tiki trick. We can take some cinnamon. Wah! The flaming mo. Flaming Homer. So there's a heck of a lot of cinnamon on here now, and that's great. That's all kind of part of the garnish and the aroma of the drink, you know? Mmm, delicious. It smells fantastic, actually. It smells like a wonderful, smoky kind of Christmas vibe from the fire and the cinnamon combined. Um, and uh, bottoms up, don't drop it on your foot, whatever you do. Jesus. Yeah, that's cool. You get, I love it. It's like there's a party in my mouth and everyone's invited. It is 
spicy, but in like a baking kind of spice, that cinnamon spice, and that's coming directly from the garnish. Uh, that raspberry is kind of up front, and that gives way to a little bit of the grenadine, the sweetness, and then that slides into this smoky thing. I mean, literally on the nose, but also the Drambuie has a bit of a smoky kind of character to it from it being a scotch-based liqueur. Um, a little bit of bitterness in there, but just the tiniest amount. The vermouth, I tried, like, I thought about doing Campari or something like that, uh, mostly for the color, but it would be too much. Um, it really would kind of dominate this drink and, and take it in a direction I didn't want. Just the slight bitterness here, though, kind of moves it from, it's not bitter, this is like bittersweet, like a bittersweet chocolate or something like that. Um, and it is sweet. It's a sweet drink, and it's got those fruit notes in it, thanks to Chambord and Grenadine, that evoke the kind of artificial, um, you know, cherry cough syrup flavors without actually tasting like cough syrup, because that is a disgusting flavor. Nobody wants cough syrup. Could I have used a uh, quino, uh, Maureen Kina? I could have. Uh, that's certainly what Matt Bellinger did. Um, I played around with it, and uh, his formulation is phenomenal. I couldn't come up with a version that leaned on the Maureen Kina that was far enough away from his, his to be my own without it tasting very strongly of the quina, the quinine, which is a, a bitter, but not the kind of bitter that I have here, not the, really what I was going for. It's a really distinct quinine. The tonic is a very distinct flavor I didn't really want present in this. Um, I did play around with cherry hearing. Cherry hearing doesn't actually, to me, taste in the same kind of cherry as that cherry cough syrup thing. This is closer, I, I really, I mean, I'm not, that's just, I'm not just blowing cinnamon smoke up your ass. Uh, that's a for real thing. Oh my God, my foot. It gets better and better too. Honestly, the more I drink it, the more I like it. I think it's perfect. I think this is the perfect Flaming Homer. It is not exactly the recreation of the episode because that's you know, chemically impossible. You can't put those things together and have anything good come out of it. And certainly not something that would light on fire. So this is uh, my Flaming Homer version. My foot is like on goddamn fire. I'm very selective in the anime that I consume. I'm not uh, a broad, anime fan. I'm not a fan of everything that comes out, but there's a few things that have really connected with me over the years. And one of them is Cowboy Bebop. I think it's time we blow this thing. Get everybody and their stuff together. Okay. Three, two, one, let's jam. So this episode is the drinks of Cowboy Bebop, and I did a lot of research to pull three specific drinks, one for each of our characters. We're gonna do a Spike drink, we're gonna do a Fae drink, and a Jet drink. So we're gonna start with Spike, who prepares himself a prairie oyster. While a brawl rages around him, he's, he's nervous in a hangover. He's got to make his, his, his eye opener there, and then it drops in his lap. So I'm going to make this in the glass, in a small glass. Now, most prairie oysters are actually non-alcoholic, but I know for certain that Spike's isn't non-alcoholic because there's a big bottle of Boofeeder gin sitting right next to him. If you start to make a prairie oyster by adding an egg yolk to the glass you're going to have it in, it's mandatory that the yolk is unbroken. I see. <laughs> then we're gonna add just a little pinch of salt and a little black pepper. Toss that in there. A couple dashes of this Worcestershire sauce. One dash of hot sauce. Traditionally, I think Tabasco, but I, I don't have any problem doing Cholula. I really like Cholula. And normally, that's the whole thing. That's it. But we know that Spike's got beef boo feeder in his. I couldn't find any boo feeder at the store, but I did find some beef feeder. So I'm gonna add an ounce of boo feeder, beef feeder. I kind of like it non-alcoholic, to be honest. I feel like this would be really good without the gin. Spike puts gin in his. I'm actually just gonna add it as like a flavor. I don't know how much Spike is putting in there. Uh, the idea is to put this right down the hatch as quick as you can. Oh, that's not bad. <laughs> the gin is nice. I actually like the gin there much more than I thought I was going to. That's pleasant. It is salty and Worcestershire and saucy with a lingering bit of heat from the hot pepper. I like that a lot. Without the gin, that might become part of my morning regimen. I'm enjoying that quite a bit. 
The next drink that I want to make is a cowboy. This is a real drink. There is almost nothing to it. I've never had it, but Jet Black orders one on Callisto. I want a cowboy. Forget it. There are no bounty heads around here. Cowboy is very simple. It is one part half and half and two parts bourbon. One ounce of half and half. Old granddad, which seems to be my bourbon of choice today. Two ounces of bourbon. Old granddad, bounded bourbon. The best earth bourbon there is. I wonder what kind of bourbon they drink in outer space actually on that series. That I don't know much about. I don't think people are still making anything on earth, so they must be drinking Mars whiskey and stuff. The next part of a cocktail is to shake it over ice. Strain this into a cocktail glass, in this case a sour glass. That's it, that's a cowboy. I don't know why this drink is called the cowboy, but that's what it is. It smells like bourbon. Better than you'd think. Huh, never had one of these before. It's not very developed, but it's pretty drinkable if you like bourbon. It tastes like bourbon. I mean, like you get kind of everything that's in that old granddad for me, which is mostly peanuts and like burny caramel. And I think that the half and half might be actually lengthening the evolution on it. And it does add a kind of creamy mouthfeel that I really like a lot, actually. It's pretty good. It's a little bit jarring because it's like, it's, an uns it's totally unsweetened and shaken, and I don't think there's too many things that you throw in a shaker that don't have some kind of sweetener in them. Definitely not my favorite drink, but it's not bad. So during the episode from Jupiter Jazz Part 1, Faye is really drowning her sorrows. She's hanging out in the bar, listening to a saxophone player play, and just drinking glass after glass of vodka. Saxophone player uh, kind of strikes up a conversation with her and takes her home to kind of look after her. Points out that he's not interested in ladies, so that she's not in any danger from him. Now she's been drinking vodka all night, but now she's not feeling so good, she's got a cold. He makes her another vodka drink, literally just a mixture of hot water and vodka. I have pretty low expectations for this one, but that's that's how the cookie crumbles. Some, some vodka. I don't know what the space vodka was that they were using. It's like Poo Feeder Gin or something, you know. That would be double, I'm gonna go to triple. The volume in hot water. Okay, so here's my vodka and water. I mean, there is something very pretty about it. It's just a crystal clear glass of liquid steaming. Mmm, smells a little bit like a doctor's office. This tastes exactly like a hot glass of water. I don't want to disappoint you. It smells like vodka. It tastes like hot water. There is nothing in this drink, so it's pretty disappointing. I had some ideas, though, knowing I was going to make this drink, about how I might improve upon it. Let's put that away, that's not, that's not good. So I'm gonna actually kind of make a vodka toddy here. It was a curative in that episode. It's a thing that she's taking to feel better. So I have some ideas about how we might do that. We're gonna add, oh, about a half an ounce of a rosemary simple syrup. Made that, it's nothing more than simple syrup that was cooked with some sprigs of fresh rosemary. And then I wanna take one lemon and I'm gonna slice this up. We're gonna make some thin slices of this lemon. The thinner the better. And I want to set these kind of inside my glass. I want to add two ounces of vodka. Now I want to add this hot water. It's just shy of boiling. I'm going to pour in four ounces. You know what would look nice in there, I think, and, and smell nice too? A sprig of fresh rosemary. So this is my improved Faye's vodka toddy. This is what Gren really should have made for Faye. What a lovely aroma, that lemon and rosemary, you can't miss. That's nice. The mildly lemon, just the right amount of sweetness, good warmer. The vodka disappears in it, there's no alcohol taste at all. It's just like a nice, soothing cup of tea, almost, except there's no tea in it. Perfect for somebody who's under the, under the weather, a great little version of a toddy. That was the drinks of Cowboy Bebop. Back in the 90s, it was pretty difficult to be plugged into what was coming out in terms of computer games. Uh, unless you had a subscription to IGN or something, you were probably just out of the loop. So one day I was walking around at PC Richards and looking at the video game selection. They used to actually come in physical boxes on shelves. And I saw the cover of a game that just the artwork drew me in and blew my mind. It was the first Fallout game. I picked it up. I took it home and I'd never seen a role playing game like this before because I'd only grown up with console JRPGs. Uh, really just like changed 
my life in a lot of ways. I love Fallout 1 and Fallout 2 in ways that I truly have a hard time describing. Uh, the drink I'm going to make right now comes from Fallout New Vegas, specifically the expansion Dead Money. Well, you know, trolling the Mojave almost makes me wish for a nuclear winter. Trolling the Mojave almost makes me wish for a nuclear winter. Trolling the Mojave almost makes me wish for a nuclear winter. Patrolling the Mojave almost makes me wish for a nuclear winter. You know, patrolling the Mojave makes me wish for a nuclear winter. <laughs> so the dead money expansion for Fallout New Vegas. Okay, so look, here's the thing. This is a pretty divisive expansion. I loved it. It's probably my favorite expansion for New Vegas. You get suckered in to going to this uh, abandoned casino uh, that opened at its grand opening gala, the night the bombs fell some like 200 or 150 years ago or whatever. You meet a ghoul there who's been there since the bombs fell. Dean Domino, uh, lounge singer. The Sierra Madre, mm, beauty, isn't she? He teaches you how to make something called the Sierra Madre Martini, which is a recipe he's perfected over like the last 150, 200 years, whatever. Once I, well, realized what you could scrounge up around here, I had a lot of time to experiment. And he makes it using some unusual ingredients. Here's the mix, if you can stomach it. You're gonna need uh, some toxic cloud residue. This is the disgusting, deadly cloud that seems to permeate the entire place, collected in a jar. You're gonna need some junk food. Uh, in the game, it is uh, always pictured to be a box of potato chips, and you're gonna need a tin can. I call it a Sierra Madre Martini. Uh, curiously, there's, there's no liquor in that, so we're gonna provide our own today. It's a pretty important item in the expansion because it gives you a lot of buffs in the game. Um, I don't think uh, the version I'm going to make today will increase your strength or perception attributes um, or anything like that. I think it will probably just increase your inebriation attribute, um, but that's fine. That's kind of what we're going for here. Uh, this version also will probably increase your cholesterol attribute, so uh, I guess that's something to be concerned about a little bit. And so to make it, you're going to need some things you probably don't need to make any other cocktails. You're going to need some genuine junk food. We're gonna use some potato chips. You're gonna need some granulated sugar. Okay, pretty basic. I'm gonna serve it in a tin can, you don't have to. Oh, this, you're gonna need a cotton candy machine. So this is a uh, cotton candy machine uh, you can buy on Amazon and there's a link below in a pinned comment. Uh, I picked out the cheapest one I could get for you. I, I wanted to get like an industrial, like a commercial grade one for like 200 bucks or whatever because it would look more like official for the show. But this one's like 35 bucks. And uh, as an added bonus, it can do either floss sugar or hard candies. You can just melt hard candies right down in there and make whatever you want. Our cotton candy is going to be our toxic cloud. Uh, and I'm pretty gosh darn pleased with myself on this one, actually. We're gonna take some sugar. It really doesn't matter how much. Just, you know, not too much, because we don't need a lot of this stuff. And some absinthe, and I'm using Le Mousse Verte, uh, this is a bit fancier than you actually need. Um, and in truth, really, this is a bit fancier than kind of be anything you like the taste of, but I think absinthe is super appropriate uh, given our setting. And we're gonna mix them together and you see we've got our green absinthe sugar. And actually, see that right there? That's a little, I kind of think that'll work, but that's probably actually uh, the wrong consistency, right? To be ideal, we probably want to dry that out a little bit with some more sugar, like that, or maybe a little bit more absinthe than that, but I think that's fine. If you don't, it smells like absinthe, it smells very strongly of absinthe, okay? Add about a tablespoon of our stuff to the center part. Pop her on. And we wait for the fun to start. Did they work again? Come on. Make me some cotton candy. It takes a while. Oh, here we go. I'm starting to see some webbing. Oh, it's floating right up to the ceiling. <laughs> now the gypsy moth weaves its cocoon. Soon all the trees in this valley will die because of this invasive species. That is our cloud residue collected on a, uh, our drinking straw. So we're gonna set that aside because we don't need that just yet. This rest of this drink is uh, even weirder, if you can believe it. We need um, a half an ounce of simple syrup, two ounces of vodka, and 
potato chips. That's right. Just put them right in there. Not potato chips, you know, like five, five potato chips. These are just basic Uts potato chips. Nothing fancy about them. Now we shake it with ice. Right, let's drop a whole cube in and uh, we'll crack the next one. Cracky, cracky. Now we shake. I'm gonna crack uh, some ice into my can. Nothing too serious, I just, you know, want some cracked up cubes in there. Now, why would I not just free pour this? Well, there's a lot of um, potato chip in here and we wanna strain that out at this point. So let's just double strain. All right, our drink is poured. We're gonna garnish with, and make it a straw, our cloud residue. And there we have a Sierra Madre Martini. Looks so good. I'll take a sip now. That tastes like potato chips. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's awesome. It's a potato chip martini, guys. Mm. And then with an absinthe. Mm. This is cool. Ooh, that's fun. We've invented the potato chip martini. My Sierra Madre martini. Um, it, it just tastes like potato chips uh, with this absinthe cloud on the side. It, um, what does absinthe taste like? A little, little bit of licorice, it's light. The absinthe is mostly, it's very, very diluted by putting it through the machine. So it's not like a smack you in the face kind of absinthe no, flavor, it's, it's pretty mild. You, uh, I don't taste the vodka at all, I, I taste the potato chips. Um, and, and the sweetness, so I added um, on this, I've made this like a couple of times in prep for the show. So, you know, the recipes are always in flux. This is a little overly sweet. You need some sweetness to bring the flavor of the potato chips out. It just doesn't, without it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, it's just too dry. Uh, the salt, it just becomes, I don't know. It doesn't taste like potato chips, it tastes like salt. When you throw a little bit of sugar in there, somehow that plus the alcohol makes the whole thing taste like you're eating potato chips. It's kind of insane. So, you know, I suppose if I was a ghoul, uh, an intelligent zombie living in, a, I'd probably, yep, I'd drink these all the time. I got into Twin Peaks a lot later than when it was airing. Since I was pretty young when it was airing, it would have been a not good thing for me to watch it when it had its first run on ABC. Uh, not good. Um, but my wife and I fell in love with the show. We watched it a few years back and I was immediately struck by the strength that we saw on the show, which was just half black and half blue, perfectly divided. Never seen anything like that. I worked uh, on and off for several years to come up with a way to make that drink. And I finally cracked it in this episode of How to Drink. Very proud of this one. I like my coffee black, black like the sky on a moonless night. Don't love the audio on this one, so I'm going to help it out. You're gonna need an ounce of sarsaparilla syrup. We'll put a link to the video with that recipe up top there. You're gonna need about an ounce and a half of bourbon. Bourbon? Bourbon. Any kind of bourbon you like will be fine here. <laughs> Pour that into a glass. Now you got your ISI Icy Whipper. Add 200 grams of creme de violet. 200 milliliters of creme de violet. You're gonna add to that two grams of this stuff called foam magic that you can get from Modernist Pantry, link provided. Seal up your icy whipper, shake it to dissolve the contents really well, then add some nitrogen cartridges, pressurize it, shake it again, and now you should have a beautiful creme de violet foam in there. Take yourself a toasted porter, snake two and a half ounces of that down into the glass with your bourbon and your sarsaparilla syrup. And then layer up that perfectly stable, delicious creme de violet foam right up to the top there. And that'll give you a look that is exactly like the Black Yukon Sucker Punch from Twin Peaks. And let me tell you what, it's delicious. You might think you're only drinking foam there, but when you take a sip, the beer comes right through it and they get to this very delicious intermingling of flavors. It's been a while since I've had it, but I do recall loving it. And I think if you make it, you'll like it too. There's the recipe for everything up there.
I avoided Rick and Morty for a long, long time. Uh, the fan base, by the time I got into it, had kind of become something of a meme, and maybe that drove me away from it. But when I finally caved and gave it a shot, I was blown away. Uh, this show really connected with me, uh, and I fell in love with it right away. I have since fallen off. I have not kept up with it. Uh, but boy, did I really enjoy those first three seasons. I'm sure it's still great. I just haven't been watching. In episode one, there is a special ingredient called Mega Seeds that they are smuggling. Uh, I thought that was a great place to make a cocktail from. Very happy with the way this one came out. Really, actually, a super delicious cocktail. Uh, but you will need some actual Mega Seeds to make it. So last time I talked about Rick and Morty, we talked about Rick uh, drinking Henny XO in the pilot, supposedly. I mentioned that if we ever did another Rick and Morty episode, we should definitely look at doing Mega Seed extract, you know the big seeds that you gotta shove way up inside there as far as they can fit. Oh jeez, Rick. Mega seeds show up as the kind of uh, MacGuffin in episode one, season one. Our introduction to this wacky, dangerous, crazy world and characters. They go to some planet and floop floor or whatever the hell it is with all those gross, weird ass things. Uh, we learn that there's a lot more to life than what you can pick up in a school. I disappoint you, but I'm- We're smart people, Jerry. They go to get the mega seeds. Uh, then they gotta go back through customs because the portal gun is out of charge. It's now in America, the FDA some time ago decided that these particular beans called Tonka beans should be illegal. And I, I mean, I'm serious now. I know these are small, but look at that. Does that not look like one of the mega seeds? I mean, they even look the same, I think. Because there's a, a, an active ingredient in here, I think it's Camarin. It was found uh, that in like psychotic doses, like if you ate 40 of these suckers, to be toxic. But like, that's like sassafras, that's like uh, cinnamon, that's like nutmeg, like all of these things, if you just like eat bushels of it, are gonna kill you. Apparently you can hallucinate on nutmeg, they didn't outlaw that. Apparently if you eat a whole bunch of cinnamon, it'll kill you. We haven't outlawed cinnamon yet, but for whatever reason, we outlawed tonka beans. Now I do know some large, Processed Foods Chemicals Company has a kind of tonka bean artificial flavor that went on the market right around the same time as the FDA outlawing the mother uh, That might be related by a senator, they're cheap. I'm in America, how do I have them? These are so easy to buy. You can buy them online and wait a really long time. And if you live in a major market, like New York City, for example, um, and you Google where to buy tonka beans in New York City, it'll help you out. There's like stores you can buy this stuff at. I, I feel like I shouldn't read the name on this label but you know, if for example, you were on a boat that was sinking, you might type out a signal there on the old. Uh... So apparently we're the largest importer of tonka beans, just like all of our other drugs, outlawed and the largest importer. So we're gonna shake this cocktail. We're gonna need one egg white. We got our egg white in there. Somebody pointed out like, whoa, you were out of your mind. You do that right over the shaker. Like that's brave or something like that. I am fearless. There are definitely things that call for shaving whole tonka bean into. Now this is, instead I made a tonka syrup, but the recipe by the way is, if I'm not mistaken, 500 grams water, 500 grams sugar, and 10 tonka beans grated, or in his case grated. I actually took the whole mess of that and just threw it in a blender, blended the crap out of it, let it sit for a few hours, and then strain, uh, heated it up to finish dissolving the sugar, and then strained it. Blender's as good as a grater. Okay, one half an ounce of my Tonka syrup, one and a half an ounce of Mr. Black. Why coffee? Rick doesn't have time for sleep. That's why. Rick's got important science stuff to do. He can do a lot of science stuff with those beans, you know? And not if he's asleep. Also, I think that the Tonka beans and the coffee are gonna, uh, are gonna jive super awesome together. We want two ounces of scotch. So, not all scotches are created equal. Everybody loves monkey shoulder. This happens to be batch number 27, which I think is the one I've seen for a while now in the store. I think that this scotch is really great here. Certainly I would not use like anything with any kind of peat or an Isla kind of nature to it. In Monkey Shoulder to me tastes, has some really new qualities. It has a, a bit of this banana funk to it, almost like a Jamaican rum. Uh, I shall demonstrate. Almost like green apples. Yeah, green apples with like a little bit of banana funk. That plus tonka beans, plus coffee. Oh man, now we're, we're cooking with gas. What an expression. The most amazing thing you could do. You're cooking with gas. Oh, so we got an egg white in there, we're gonna dry shake. One big, one cracked.
Uh, for garnish, take one of the tonka beans, cut it in half, and then just kind of grate that ever so lightly over the top of the drink. I mean, it's at this point, this whole drink is extremely tonka-y. You need so little of this, and I'm going way over the top. You gotta cut it in half though, because you want the inside. That little shell on the outside, that'll mess up. It won't grate very cleanly. Let's see how these mega seed extract do. Oh my God. That is heaven in a glass. It's so good. It has such a long evolution. So good, so good. Oh my God. First off, it is decadent. This is a rich flavor, and it's still evolving. I, I oh so sweaty. I'm a disgusting sweat hog. I love the white head on that with that cream, that perfect coffee color. Chocolatey coffee. Then the coffee comes back uh, over, powers the chocolate. Now vanilla and cinnamon. And now what is that? Is that allspice or is that cinnamon? Somewhere between allspice and cinnamon and some toasted caramel uh, for sure. Oh man, that's cool. And it's like still in my mouth. I still taste it. Woo! We're gonna get riggedy riggedy wrecked, son! This is a freaking phenomenal drink. The mega seeds are already working, I'm smarter. What is, you know, 1,400,000, 75 billion uh, divided by zero? What is it? Zero. What's 21 minus eight? I don't know. Oh, 21 minus eight is 19? Yes. <laughs> is that accurate? It's, it's not? <laughs> Oh no, the secondary effect of the mega seed is kicking in. Oh man, oh, oh, jeez, oh. I'm sorry, Morty, it's a bummer. If you haven't seen Peacemaker yet, starring John Cena, you are really missing out. This show is way better than it has rights to be. It was a super fun ride from beginning to end. And very graciously for me and my line of work, they make an actual cocktail on the show, which doesn't happen that often, uh, with the ingredients named. And uh, I made it, and I liked it a lot better than the characters in the show did. I don't know. I think it was a good drink. Why don't you watch and maybe try it yourself, and you let me know. It's one of my favorites that I've ever made for the show. There is a point in the series in which our eponymous peacemaker decides to pour himself and his friend a cocktail. It's called a peace train. It is gin vermouth, vinegar, peppercorn, a little maple syrup, and some yak butter. Yak butter? Hard to find an evergreen side. So I'd use normal butter. And in the show, it is not a drink that anybody likes. Oh my god. Oh my god! What the fuck, man? That's rude. Oh, what's rude is you give me a feces drink? A lot of people were tweeting this thing at me that I gotta make it, and it took me a minute to get around to it, so I apologize. And also, James Gunn did not specifically at me, but he did ask for some drink YouTuber out there somewhere to make this drink. I am that drinks tube. So to make this drink, I've got all my ingredients here. Let's just make it the way he said I should make it. I looked into the whole yak butter thing because I was like, well, maybe there's something there. What's up with the yak butter? Is that just like, is that just a gag? Is yak butter a common ingredient? It's not common, but it is a thing. Yak butter ghee and ghee is clarified butter, uh, which is what I have here. This is regular ghee from good old Trader Joe's. Yak butter ghee is like a common like health food store thing, or like not common, but like common enough. And there are things that he drops throughout the show uh, being a non-super super. He doesn't have any like innate superpowers. He is concerned with his diet to an unhealthy degree um, in this show. But it occurs to me that like some point in his life was shopping at the health food store I can't get there anymore, and so he's using regular butter instead of yak butter. So I think that that's, that's valid. I think yak butter is valid. But I also had a hard time getting yak butter, so we're gonna go with clarified butter ghee, um, which is fine. If you're gonna put butter in a cocktail, this is probably the right stuff to use. It'll, it shakes better. You could throw this in a shaker and it disappears into the drink like an actual ingredient, unlike a stick of butter, which will not. And that's it, I'm gonna shake this drink up, as he described. Um, now, of course, we don't have his measurements. We do have to interpret a little bit. Uh, the one thing we do know for sure is that he was using aviation gin. You can see it in the background of the shot there. Um, I think that might be a Green Lantern reference. It could be. Okay, let's do it. Let's make this drink. Okay, so he calls for vinegar. Uh, I think based on what I saw, it was just plain white vinegar in the episode. I don't think he was using balsamic or like a red wine. I think it was just plain white vinegar. This is like a food vinegar. He may have been using like, you know, household cleaning vinegar, which would be a bit much. That's a quarter ounce of white vinegar. A vinegar is a very 
very powerful ingredient. I don't think that's gonna taste so good. I don't think that's gonna taste so good at all, actually. I'm gonna add to that a half an ounce of maple syrup. Just kind of thinking about where I'm going with this drink, what we're balancing towards. Trader Joe's maple. I think that he probably would shop at a Trader Joe's if there was a Trader Joe's nearby. We need yak butter um, and about an ounce of it. Um, or in this case, it's not yak butter, of course, it's just regular ghee. So this is something you kind of do with a spoon. It's warm enough in here that it wants to liquefy. That's almost an ounce. I might do like a little bit more than that. Butter, butter and vinegar in the peace train. I'm gonna drink this. All right, so we need some peppercorn. Uh, I'm just gonna put a couple twists from my grinder here. And now we're into actual alcohol, um, vermouth. In the show, the vermouth we see him use is definitely light in color. You could use whatever you want. I don't think it's gonna make too much of a difference. I think that a dry vermouth will really disappear into this drink. There's like no chance of you tasting that at all. Uh, so I'm going with a Bianco, like a Blanc vermouth. This is a white vermouth that is of a sweeter style. It's not gonna make the drink overly sweet. I just don't think a dry vermouth has any chance at all of cutting through this flavor. So we're gonna put an ounce of Bianco vermouth in there. I mean, I smell that, that's pretty powerful. And I want two ounces of my uh, aviation gin, which we know is the gin he was using. Uh, so that's our drink. Let's shake it. Crack my other ice cube. Ooh, my butter is cold. Not not looking so good in there. My butter is looking very. Um, solid. Maybe I should have dry shook this first. I should have dry shook this first. I'm trying to break up this butter. I'm gonna put that in there. It was a lot of butter in there. A lot of floating butter pieces. I don't know. That kind of looks like what it looks like in the show, if I recall. I mean, it's dark and I think the glass is green, but a lot of black peppercorn in there. A lot of butter. Honestly, that smells kind of nice. It smells, the vinegar is intense, but like in the way that anything with chartreuse in it would be intense too. Like it's actually not crazy. In the show, she drinks it and she calls it a feces drink. I don't think it's gonna taste like feces. I can't draw a comparison. I haven't tasted too much feces. Any, I hope. That's like surprisingly good. That is way better than it has any right to be. I want that to be bad, but it's a little one note, but it kind of has like this super, it's like on the edge of like artificial green apple taste, but it's just shy of that where it's like, it kind of tricks you or me into being like, hot damn, that is just the freshest, tartest, green, sour apple I've ever had in my life. Something about the vinegar with the maple syrup. You don't taste the maple syrup at all, but I also don't taste vinegar. Something happens between them where we get this new flavor. It's like a chord on a piano, you know? <laughs> you play three different notes, you get this emotion. That's kind of the idea, I guess, with all cocktails. It's gross to look at. I mean, there's chunks of floating butter and pepper in there, but it might even be good. I'm embarrassed to say, I like it. God damn it. I, it's good. I gotta check out what other people did with this drink because I don't think anybody I think people are making it and it's disgusting and they're hating it. I wanna know what specs they're using because this is fine. <laughs> Do you wanna try it? Yeah, your curve might be a little different since you've truly tasted hell. I mean, I wouldn't choose it, but it's not. I would choose it. Really? I like it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't dislike it. <laughs> I don't think that the butter needs to be in there at all. I'm getting... It's a lot of vinegar. If it was a little less vinegar, it's not bad. Yeah. If I was served that, I would drink it. I don't think I'd order it again. Fine. I can understand that. I can respect that. Yeah, I might not order it a second time for my second round at the bar, but I would, I would remember it fondly. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I am still not really a fan of Archer. Uh, the show is, uh, I think it's kind of mean. I think it's a mean show. I can't, but I know people say it's satire. I don't know. For me, it just feels mean. I don't know. But 
a lot of people are huge fans of the show. Uh, there are a lot of original cocktails and very uh, inventive cocktails. I've done two drinks from it. Um, one of them uh, was the Horatio Corn Blower. And the minute I heard that drink name, I had an idea for what I wanted to make it because I had previously had a cocktail that used corn silk tea in it. And I thought it was super interesting. I know that in the episode, it wasn't really a corn silk tea thing. It was sort of a fuzzy navel made wrong, but I couldn't resist. I had to make a Horatio corn blower the way I wanted to. And boy, did it come out good. Uh, I want one ounce of my corn silk tea syrup. Now this is really just a sugar syrup that's two parts sugar to one part um, corn silk tea. I'm providing a link in the comments right below uh, to that corn silk tea and the recipe write up is there as well. An ounce seems like a lot, but it really is sort of the star of this drink. If you want to scale that back, you're free to experiment. Um, but it is like the, to me, it's kind of the unique thing that makes this drink its own thing. I want a quarter ounce of this orchard peach. And I want two ounces of, quiet you, my delicious Bottled and Bond Mellow Corn. And the other thing I want is one dash of this saline solution. This is a 20% saline solution. Um, it's, it's basically, uh, if it was, uh, if I take a scale, I put, 20 grams of salt on the scale, and then I add uh, 80 grams of water, and we have a 20% solution that way, right? Heat it up until it's dissolved, and there you go. It's basically salt water. Uh, one little dash. Now, why am I adding that? Well, I'll just it's not gonna make the drink salty, but that salt is gonna help bring the peach and the corn flavors together. And for those of you who don't have a bottle of corn silk syrup, uh, a handy, I'll tell you what it tastes like. It tastes a little bit like the milk that's left over after a bowl of corn pops. It's freaking delicious, is what it is. Oh, uh, side note, uh, my favorite joke in this episode by far is don't listen, it's not diegetic. I love a good film joke. Crack some ice in here. There we go. I'm gonna pour that into a coop. Um, it's totally optional, but this drink, you know, an orange twist won't hurt it. This gives it a little bit more brightness. Um, some of these flavors can become a little heavy without it. Now, Let's give this a taste. Well, before I give this a taste, I know what you're saying. You're gonna say, hey, in that episode, that thing he's making is just a blender drink. It's just a, a garbage uh, thing he's drinking out of a blender with a silly straw. I know, I know, I know. He's making kind of a um, uh, uh, bottom of the barrel version of a hairy navel. Um, and I could do that and you could do that. That's pretty easy to do. Uh, I thought it would be more fun to take the idea and do an evolution on it, so. Horatio corn blower. I like that a lot. It's <laughs> so cool. It is so, the peach is super present. The corn comes in late. You get that peach thing right up front. Um, and it's like this kind of, you just, I mean, it just tastes like fresh. It really does it taste like fresh peaches. It's delicious. It's sweet, maybe a little sweeter than some might like, but I don't think it's too, too sweet. It's a sweeter drink. It's a pretty accessible drink. It's smooth. I mean, and I mean that in a literal sense. It has a very smooth mouth feel. Um, it really coats the inside of your mouth and is in that, not aerated, you know? I mean, it's not a shaken drink, so it shouldn't be. It's smooth, smooth, silky, heavy, like silk. Uh, in your mouth, a uh, silk mouth, mouth of silk, a mouthful of silk. And that transitions into the corn silk. 
and you really get a nice taste of corn. It's got a little heat to it as well. I mean, that 100 proof uh, mellow corn in this drink it puts a little fire underneath it, which I like. It doesn't bother me at all. It's not overpowering. It's just there. It's just letting you know this drink is going to mess you up if you drink a lot of it. And then right there, at that much time is how long it takes. It All of a sudden, the corn really attacks back from the sides of your tongue and wraps around. And it's just this sweet, um, like corn pops thing. It has a slight, it's not the right word. I'm gonna say smokiness, but I don't mean the kind of smokiness at all that you would find in like a smoky scotch. It has just a, a burned kind of a thing to it. Um, I love it. I think it's probably what you're tasting there is the fact that the corn silk is toasted. So you're probably getting that kind of, uh, whatever happens to that corn silk chemically when it gets heated and some stuff breaks down and then the Maynard effect happens to it. You're getting some of that, it's got a toastiness to it. Let's say that. Like so many men of my generation, I grew up obsessed with Back to the Future. It was so much fun, that movie, that series, the very concept of the time machine, the uh, wild antics of Doc Brown. You could relate so much to Marty McFly. He was like a guy you wanted to be at my age group. You know, you wanted to grow up and be Marty McFly. So in Back to the Future 3, we find ourselves in the wild old west. Doc Brown happens to have a shot of whiskey, is immediately dropped to the floor so I had to make the wake-up juice that we see used in the bar in that scene. They make it look so easy in the movies. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> well, that was really unpleasant. I don't know if I could have been an old westerny person. I can't do that. now. They don't tell us what's in Wake Up Juice, but from the film and a keen eye, we can tell that it's olive juice, mustard seed, chili flake, cayenne powder, onion powder, and Tabasco sauce. And I, for science, as a scientist, endeavor to do that. I've got this here beer mug. Now, truth be told, there is no way I am able to fill this beer mug with Wake Up Juice. I will add I shall now add to the beer mug my olive brine. Mmm, that looks extremely appetizing. My onion powder. Okay, this might hurt some. My, oh my God, why did I put that much in there? What am I doing to myself? That was the cayenne. Cayenne is hot. The chili flakes. I should have had a softer hand on the cayenne and a heavier hand on the chili flakes and the mustard seeds, which uh, yeah, I was about to say, scare me a little bit because I know you can make a nerve agent with it. Gotta work those seeds together. Oh yeah. It smells much better than you would think, actually. I mean, I, I wanna say that like, it doesn't sound, smell like anything I wanna put in my mouth, but it does smell kinda nice. It's a, it smells a bit like a, something you would marinate a steak with or, um, uh, a dry rub, something like that. It's on its way to being basically barbecue. Let's just pretend that I'm unconscious and that someone's gonna pour this in my mouth of the funnel. I don't wanna disappoint you, but I'm not gonna drink this whole thing. I think that would actually kill me. I'm just gonna have a sip, but. It is mustardy, spicy, and oniony. My mouth is tingling. I'm not gonna lie, I really thought that I was just gonna respond by immediately dropping off camera and vomiting. It is way better than I thought it was gonna be. Oh, I forgot the Tabasco. I've been informed that I my, my wake up sauce juice is incomplete. I feel like I'm in the Marx Brothers. I've been informed that my wake up juice is incomplete because I forgot my Tabasco. This is accurate, I did. There we go. Now we're gonna stir that again. Sorry, do over, fellas. <coughs> ah, the dainty tinkling of the toddy stick. Yeah, well, well, here we go. Hot, spicy. 
Real hot. Really hot. Mostly mustard, Tabasco. So my mouth's on fire, but honestly, it, I mean, I, I would love to play this bigger, but really the truth is, is that it's really not any hotter than any buffalo wings I've ever had. What I wanna do now is take what I just experienced, that hot and spicy stuff, and that combination of bourbon, and turn that into a hot, spicy bourbon hangover drink, a breakfast drink, a hair of the dog, uh, something you would have at brunch. We're gonna riff that out on the fly. I think it's a shaken drink, so we're gonna need a shaker, as one does when you shake a drink. We're gonna add a bar spoon of my cayenne powder. Um, and a bar spoon of chili flake. We're gonna add in two or three bar spoons of onion powder. These mustard seeds. Okay, well, I know what we're gonna do. We're gonna add in um, two bar spoons of mustard seed. I had to dry off my muddler because what I wanna do now is use that to kind of crack those mustard seeds. Kind of make a poultice in here. Okay, we've kind of cracked that up a little bit. Let's do an ounce of olive brine. Not really designed for pouring, doing our best here. Let's add in two ounces of our Buffalo Trace bourbon. I'm just thinking also thematically now, right? And this is how my brain works with this stuff. We're making like an 1880s morning after hair of the dog drink. It's gotta be a little bit medicinal. It's gotta have bitters in it. And it's kind of that Western thing. I think we need um, four dashes, two dashes. Let's go two dashes of Peixot's bitters. Nice. Mmm, I'm getting somewhere with this. A little gum syrup, maybe? Maybe? Sure, what the heck? I mean, it'll either help, it'll be an invisible flavor in this drink. It will just be there to kind of help bring things together. We're gonna put in two bar spoons uh, of gum syrup. Um, I think we're ready to shake. I don't know what else I would add into something like this, but I, I also don't know exactly what kind of a drink I'm making at the moment. So whatever, that's fine. Some things are like that. That's how you experiment. Uh, I'm gonna add in my whole cube. I'm gonna add in my broken cube. I'm just gonna open pour this directly into a beer mug. And now, I'm gonna top that up with some seltzer. Just to give it a little bit of length. And we'll stir that up a bit. And this will be the how to drink version of wake up juice. It's not bad. That's not bad at all. It's honestly. Oh, we forgot the, we forgot the, the we forgot the, needs this, it totally needs this. Yeah, definitely add a bottle of Tabasco sauce. No, add a lot of Tabasco sauce. I'm gonna garnish this with uh, some chili peppers. Let's do three of them. Well, look, I'm not gonna lie, it ain't attractive, but we made it up on the fly. Let's see how, how to drink wake-up juice goes. The nose is one of Tabasco and vinegar and death. That ain't bad. It is cayenne forward. <laughs> um, the cayenne is very forward, and that gives way to chili and mustard. Uh, with a vinegar base that you get kind of throughout. The tonsils have a unique sensation of tingling and burning that is new to me. Um, 
The bourbon is a little bit lost in it. Let's go back in for another taste and see if we can get that bourbon out. <sighs> yeah, that's a real peppery nose. You know, I don't really love the peppery like margaritas and things. I'm not a big fan of spicy drinks, but. I actually really like it in my mouth. The drinking part of it is very nice, and then the heat comes after. The mustard is there. That cayenne, that chili, it's not bad. With vinegar, it just tastes like you're, it's, it's hot. It's a hot drink, but it's not like Carolina Reaper hot. It's not Death Pepper hot. It's not, I don't know what this would rank on the Scoville sale, the scale, but, I'm just hoping that Sean Evans is going to ask me to come over and eat hot wings with him one of these days. I just wanted to prep up. I thought this might be a good way to get ready for those buffalo wings. You know, the one thing I would say is that the bitters are a little bit lost. Uh, we could probably skip the bitters. And honestly, I think that pretty much anything we add to it is going to get lost in this drink. It's pretty good, though. I mean, honestly, I'm not even, I really, you guys, I've, it sounds like I'm joking. I'm not. As a morning after drink. Um, as a hangover remedy. I could definitely see people enjoying this. Uh, it might not be my cup of tea, but it's not too bad. You can see that I keep going back for more, so. And coming. And it's a little bit cumulative. So now my lips are burning probably two or three times the amount that they were before. <coughs> Well, I hope you all like this one. I know it's a huge departure. Um, a lot of these drinks, you know, the show was a lot smaller. You may have missed them if you've come to the show since they were made. Uh, that's totally understandable. But if you were interested in knowing what my favorite original creations for the show were, the ones that really uh, kind of surprised myself with, these are them, or at least the ones that are based on movies, TV, and games. There's probably more territory to cover in this vein. Uh, so if you guys like this kind of thing and you want to see more of it, just let me know. We can definitely do more of these on a semi-regular basis. Until then, thank you so much for watching. If you feel like liking or subscribing or commenting or whatever, that would be fine. But you know what would be great is if you wanted to check out some of those older episodes. Uh, there's links up in the info cards. They're up here on the corners and they'll be down in the pinned comment below. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next time on How to Drink.